Welcome to Lola and the Poets, a podcast on the magical reel. Welcome to Lola and the Poets. My name is Milana and I shall be your host. In episode 8, Lola and the Poets is back after two years in the wilderness, which in view that I found great joy in hosting it and even had a small but lovely audience presents an increasingly strange and eerie state of affairs. However, I found a perfect vehicle to reboot, recharge and rejuvenate my lost podcast, the presentation I gave on enchantment and the cinema at Goldsmiths, University of London, and this was this June, end of June to be exact, at the Symposium on 21st Century Magic and Spirituality in Media and Culture. The video recording of the event itself went a bit sideways, but... I have now taped the audio for the paper for the purposes of Lola and the Poets. The theme is, I think, great for a solo show, as the content of the presentation fits the format and mission of this podcast perfectly. I hope you enjoy, despite the academic phrasing, it is also, in my humble opinion, entertaining. And hopefully, you'll also find it somewhat enlightening, hence the bolt in the show's visuals. It is also, dare I say, mildly Promethean, as it had a long road before reaching others. Finally, the symposium audience seems to have enjoyed it, along with picking cards from the cinema oracle I created for that occasion. In any case, please do wish me good tidings. I have many fun, innovative, super niche shows lined up for you. But it seems I also need a bit of gambler's luck to go with the work and the wits. Bless you all, my feral friends, and let's roll. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to listen to him over the radio. And unless he says something that's, well, that's sensational, it's just no good. This paper is an amalgamation of my earlier work on film as an alchemical medium, with a few new insights on immersion in narratives and cinema and the body while honoring my lifelong interest in phenomena termed otherworldly, mystical, transcendent, supernatural. For me, these existential curiosities had always presented unexplainable yet authentic experiences that most of us have within our lifetimes. Ones we can observe in their effect, but not in their causality, and which have in their scintillating unknowability provoked multitudes of belief-based and concept-based explanations for millennia. So third time's a charm. Let's start with three dilemmas, with hope of the third unlocking the entire pack. First, the one about the nature of things. Did human desire for magic escape the scorn of enlightened rational thought through the vehicle of the newly minted medium of cinema? a presence born in extreme turn-of-the-century mechanical circumstances, emerging ghost-like, its images embalmed in celluloid, its wings coated in silver, its avant-garde light-sensitive designer mummy travelling through linear time in circular motion, 24 frames per second, offering its audiences an illusion of movement, 
while projecting them into a dynamic and abstract mythic moment, a virtual ritual space, an impromptu group reverie, or perhaps a psychological compost pot where a number of exceptional experiences can occur if the alchemical temperature of the narrative has accidentally or purposefully been set to transmutation. In Marie-Louise von Franz's Alchemy, she advises how to resurrect the inner sun, an alchemical symbol of pure consciousness. Go back to the original point of your consciousness, she says. Try to return to the place from which your consciousness comes to the threshold of the unconscious, and then link up. So secondly, there is the dilemma of connection. Did the popular cinematic preservation of apparitions, wizards, demons, witches, and enchantments film as the custodian of magic of sorts, a safe place where all our uncanny fantasies reside, somehow directly facilitate the cornucopia of esoteric beliefs and practices in the 21st century. This renaissance of the casual spiritual at a time when the medium of the moving image is almost entirely rejecting its filmic physical body, becoming its own digital echo. In fact, losing both its metonyms in the additional abandoning of its physical abode, the cinema theater and maybe thus causing what could flippantly be dubbed metaphysical spillage, with its very nature fragmented, altered, and forever changed. Thirdly, there is a dilemma of place. As all content needs a container, every event a venue, each human a home, or, as Donna Haraway puts it in her book, Staying with the Trouble, nobody lives everywhere, she says. Everybody lives somewhere. Nothing is connected to everything. Everything is connected to something. So, the 20th century cinema metaphorically and metaphysically burst into the streets, bodiless and abodeless, and take over our 21st century physical selves, as well as our residences. Are our own lives now the alchemical silver screen? And if they are, what are the consequences? How does this symbiosis work? Or are we simply haunted by cinema? On a side note, and not unrelated, in this dystopian dream I had more than a decade ago, humanity had merged with its appliances, ones they had at hand at the moment of a major cataclysm, and not the glamorous ones either, rather toasters and coffee makers and hair dryers, maybe a few smartphones. That cyborgian life turned out to be entirely unworkable as we all ended up using old phone booths instead to communicate. In Death 24 Times a Second, Laura Mulvey concludes that there is an irony in the way phantoms conjured up by early cinema have caught up with the ever-increasing crowd of ghosts that now haunt it. However, cinema's role in preserving an even increasing societal hunger for the unknowable and otherworldly, the abandonment of the palpable for the ecstasy of the enchanted as witnessed in augmented and virtual realities could only have worked if what it was transmitting and maybe transforming had always been with us, within us, and then hidden or taken away. It could have thus facilitated the retrieval of its loss. At the same time, disconnected from our tangible and intangible magical heritage, did we learn what it means to live in an enchanted universe through the template of cinema. In her journey into dream time, Munya Andrews says that a person's calling to be a healer differs among various nations, and sometimes the ability to heal is handed down from one generation to another through their family dreaming. Who or what was our source to teach us how to dream? In arriving at a provisional answer, or rather an avenue of inquiry, to all the dilemmas proposed, we might need a severe change in perspective. Dispelling our own jaded evil eye. Untangling a self-fulfilling prophecy demoted into tired tropes of the end of history. 
to understand the incredible potency of cinematic imagery in our personal histories, a revisiting of both early film theory and early psychology in reframing mystical experiences, particularly relating to our psyche's immersion in narratives, could prove to be of great benefit. In a sense, it will be both an unlearning and a recontextualizing, because lest we forget, cinema and psychology are time twins, born of the same late 19th century empirical desire to technologize and engineer our imaginations and existence, indeed, life itself, unwild and neatly packaged that which Freud had so famously and dismissively labeled the black tide of mud of occultism. This is me imitating Freud, which can be found when psychoanalysts believed in magic, an article, you have it online. So, despite his own inquiries in the field, when arguing with Jung on the latter's passionate interest in such matters, which in time grew into a lonely obsession in his professional circles, it actually might have caused the final rift between the two men. In one great swoop of scientific Eurocentric house cleaning, magic became fantasy, gods became psyche, and prophecy a bingo card. The Mounts of Delphi, where poetry was divination and divination was philosophy, slowly faded in the mist and from view. Now, this blatantly reductive, enthusiastically controversial rewind works in that it retrieves the element loss in a world saturated with images and interpretations. A freshness of framing in considering an entirely unknown phenomena or even a complete discipline by observing it primarily in terms of its initial subjective impact. Antonin Artaud, in his essay on Sorcerer in the Cinema, spoke of film in its raw state emitting something of the atmosphere of a trance. You can find it in Hammond. André Bazin compared the urge to film with the ancient Egyptian tradition of mummifying the dead. You can find it in more. Jean Epstein thought of cinema as polytheistic and theogonic, as it summons objects, creating lives that have little to do with human life and are more like the life in charms and amulets, ominous tabooed objects, also for more. Bella Balash assigned to the film camera the power to photograph the subconscious, also more. The machines create a double, a doppelganger, by translating a person into an image, Hawke analysis say. This conjured mechanical other, our simulacrum sibling, has all the geography of its original, but its nature is not the same. It will be wise to also point out that this process allows for an ample playing ground for artists and practitioners of the esoteric arts to apply the medium in their own belief-based practice. But what of the audience's participation in this narrative sorcery? Its ongoing fascination with haunted universes, the occult patterning of a film, both in execution and in content. Talking about liminal spaces of mesmerizing entertainment expanding into uncharted areas of entertaining enchantment, we could conclude that a kind of narrative mesmerism could ring true of all art forms. However, film, in its complete reliance on technology, seems to have the most reflective power of all. In sync with Marshall McLuhan's concept of no history and the perpetual present in media, in removing its audience from linear time, film allows for a cosmic repetition, not a Judeo-Christian competition. This is from Linden. Francisca Cho, a religious studies scholar, has pointed out that the dichotomy between historical and mythic time does not exist in Chinese thought. Thus, the key purpose for all myths is to provide patterns for living a life. Also, Linden. As quoted previously, Marie-Louise von Franz spoke of threshold phenomena, allowing for, she says, eruptions from the unconscious into the consciousness, which have both creative and destructive potential. This is via Hawke and Alistair. In alchemy, Bringing the conflict of opposites into consciousness leads to the recognition of an alien other in oneself, the Mercurius, which was conceptualized by alchemists as the source of all opposites. This is Papadopoulos. 
Balazs believed that the peculiarity of film as art is that unlike all other art forms today, the permanent and inner distance from the work of art both fade out of consciousness of the spectator in order for one to willingly take part in cinema's mesmerism. More. Finally, Jung himself concluded that what he termed primitive pathology, primitive with, of course, quotation marks, expresses this exalted condition very aptly as spirit interference. In fact, in Jung's Psychology and the Occult, I came upon this fascinating and perfectly elegant analogy between the said indigenous people's concept of soul pathology and Jung's concept of the unconscious in the clear distinction they make between two causes of mental illness and hence also somatic maladies. One being the loss of soul and second, the possession by spirit. Jung termed the former soul complexes, unconscious complexes that normally belong to the ego, and the latter spirit complexes, ones that normally should not be associated with it. If any ego-associated complex becomes repressed, the individual experiences a sense of loss, and when it is made conscious again, an increased sense of power. However, if a complex of what Jung termed collective unconscious becomes associated with the ego, thus emerging into consciousness, it fascinates the individual, but also carries with it a disturbance, an uncanny presence, alienation from everyday life. Removal of this imposing content from consciousness would hence bring about a sense of relief. So where are we now? Perhaps at a place or phase I provisionally coined archetypal enchantment, a state of partial inflation, a steady low-key infection with collective narratives, an emotionally altered state, usually only temporary, while an interest lasts. However, in cases of continuous immersion in ongoing virtual narratives, maybe even a phase that could be long-lasting. My further purpose in following this gold thread of reasoning through a lacework of dream-weaving silver is to understand how the potentially transformative aspects of this condition of being inundated, overflowing with content one cannot contain, can be geared towards growth and healing as well as co-creation with others, a realignment with a human, non-human and other than human rather than allowing the genuine pleasure and enchantment itself trap the psychic energy of an individual by holding one captive in a perpetual, ritual, and infantile state of imaginary action. 21st century humanity, with its blossoming need for spiritual revival, arrived at a tipping point, one that could potentially permanently blur the lines between imagination and delusion. The proverbial crossroads, a good time to dispel fantasies and bring back the magic, an act of sculpting a fantastical narrative in poetic time, not unlike cinema, yet aligned with what might be present in our bodies and this world. An integration of the two hemispheres at an equal footing, not just within our own psyches, rather of us as elements in the vast tapestry that is the Anima Mundi.